Hi, Hi everybody. everybody. I'm Noor from the School of Cities, and I would like to welcome you to today's session of Knowledge Cafe featuring Dr. Taniguchi. Dr. Taniguchi will be doing the land acknowledgement in just a couple of minutes, but until then, Knowledge Cafe is brought to you by the School of Cities, the University of Toronto's multidisciplinary center for urban research, education, and engagement. It is dedicated to discovering new ways for cities and their residents to thrive. The Knowledge Cafe is a monthly speaking opportunity for a member of the tri-campus community at the University of Toronto to present insights and highlights of their research on a theme that is important and relevant to urban environments. It provides a platform for faculty, students, and researchers who are working to uncover solutions to create a more just, equitable, sustainable, and prosperous city. Today's Today's session of Knowledge Cafe features Dr. Ai Taniguchi, who will be discussing the subject of language as a form of home. Ai Taniguchi is, a professor, is an assistant professor from the teaching stream of English Language Linguistics and Online Teaching in the Department of Language Studies at UTM. Her teaching expertise is in, the, in public communications of linguistics. As a linguist and an artist, she works at the intersection of linguist, linguistics and the visual arts to identify and address crises that communities are facing surrounding language. In her language, identity, multiculturalism, and global empowerment, Limesh project, she uses the medium of comics for public education of linguistics. Before we begin, I would like to couple of, I would like to cover a couple of housekeeping rules. Today's session will be recorded and we ask attendees to keep their mics off during the presentation. We also encourage you to put questions in the chat and they'll be answered at the end of the session. Please practice good etiquette. People demonstrating inappropriate language or behavior will be removed. And without any further ado, we we'll give it to Dr. Um, Taniguchi. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so. Thank you for the, the wonderful introduction. Again, uh, my name is Ai, uh, and uh, I am an assistant professor from the UTM. And uh, uh, as Norse said, I am the principal investigator of the Limage project, uh, pronounced the French way. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it in just a second. Um, but I am a linguist and an artist, uh, and I don't have any formal training in art, but I have been drawing since I was very little, and it's sort of my safe space for expressing myself. And so I'm grateful to be at U of T where I can sort of work at this intersection of linguistics and art. Um, so as mentioned earlier, I use comics for the public education of linguistics, and I, I make all the comics myself, actually. Um, and before I go on, also, yes, questions in the chat is great, but I also um, suffer from social anxiety. And so um, like any kind of reaction in the chat is actually appreciated, whether it be like LOL or just like smiley faces or like laughing, crying emojis, anything like that. If you feel compelled to react during the um, these, uh, session, um, please, by all means, uh, use the chat for that. I do really appreciate it. Yes, I see the reactions and things like that as well. And so it just kind of uh, makes me uh, uh, feel like yeah, everyone's actually listening and things like that. So I appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> honestly, yeah, LOL and things like that, too. Appreciate it. Okay, super. So um, I wanted to start today by talking about a word that I learned at the All Nations Powwow that took place at UTM um, last year, right? Last year, 2023. Yeah. So um, UTM is on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the credit. And at this powwow, um, Valerie King, who is the head elder uh, and the waterkeeper of the Mississaugas of the credit First Nation, gave this opening remark where she um, generously taught us about this word nibi uh, in Anishinaabemowen or Ojibwe. Um, and so she was saying that basically water is life. Uh, and water flows through all of us and water keeps us alive, right? So, but at the same time, if we're not careful, water can take our lives too. So she was saying that this is why, you know, like she she prays with the water and that's why we show respect to water every time we drink it and things like that. Yeah. 
So this teaching that Valerie generously shared with our university community reminded me of a saying that we actually have in Japanese. I am of Japanese heritage. Um, and so the saying is um, in sui shigen, in sui shigen. Um, and so it's literally uh, drink water, think origin is what it means. Um, so basically, this is a saying that says, um, you know, when you take a sip of water, you need to remember uh, and be grateful for where the water comes from is what this saying means, uh, which is is kind of similar to what Valerie was saying. So um, more metaphorically speaking, it says that it's important that you stop from time to time and think about your origins too and where you come from as well, right? And so sort of a reflection on your positionality. So, you know, water gives you life. So every time you drink water, it's an opportunity for you to think about why you are the way you are, right? This is sort of what we have in common between um, the Anishinaabe uh, saying and also the Japanese saying here. And so today I want to talk about a little bit first about the importance of reflecting on who you are and where you come from, um, because I think this tells you a lot about why you do the things that you do in your everyday life, including the teaching, the way that you teach in class and way that you do research, right? Um, and so uh, because, because of your background, um, there are things that you probably excel at, right? Because of my Japanese American heritage, right? There are things that I really excelled at in the Limage project, for example, being relatable to students, for example, right? But also because of your background and your upbringing, there are probably things that, you know, uh, you have oversights about and things that, you know, you have ignorance about. And I learned that about that a lot uh, through the Limage project as well. And so uh, this is, I think, uh, an important thing to reflect on every time you engage with any kind of project, yeah. So um, I want to start with this question. I'm not sure if you guys were expecting to have to participate in this kind of uh, uh, kind, kind of uh, presentation. But so this like uh, both of these things kind of speak to like where you come from, where your home is, right, where your origins are. So if I could ask in the chat, what or where is home to you? Could I get some insights about if when like just your Initial reaction to this, what, what, like, where is, what or where is home to you? What do you think? Canada, right? Algeria, UK, right? Is it where you come from, where you live right now? There's many ways to answer this question, right? With family, maybe not a particular city, but wherever your family is, Toronto, I think for a lot of people right now, right? If you live here, mm -hmm, right? Six Nations, the Grand River Territory, right? Yeah. Whose land are we on, right? What do we call it? And things like that as well, yeah. Where you feel you belong, yeah, right? Sometimes it's sort of a mental space, I think as well, yeah. Thank you for sharing that with me, yeah. Um, so home for me is wherever I move to, as some of you have also indicated, I feel like. Um, I have moved around a lot in my life. I was born in the UK actually, and then moved to US, the US, and then from US to Japan in 1996. But, um, so I'm Japanese American by heritage. Um, both of my parents are Japanese. I grew up speaking Japanese at home and English outside of the home. So I'm fully bilingual in Japanese and English. So um, sometimes, you know, where, home is for me like you know wherever you feel the most comfortable and so sometimes for me home is like this mixture of Japanese and English that I speak which I call Japanglish sometimes and like that's where I am really myself when I'm talking to my brother uh, for example in this Japanglish language right uh, and, and it's for me like this is an important thing because it, it, like that language is with me wherever I go to around the globe right so um, I grew up in the southern region of the United States in Peachtree City Georgia uh, at the age of six. And so this is me in 1999, actually, when I was nine years old. And uh, uh, funny thing about this picture, actually, is the you see the design on the t-shirt that people are wearing in this photo. Um, this was for like this like marathon that we had locally at our school. And I actually designed this t-shirt design uh, for, for, the, for the school. There was like a contest and I won the contest and they picked my design for this. Um, and so as you can tell, I've been drawing for a really long time. And at the time, you know, my English, I wasn't completely fluent in English. So art was a way for me to connect to my peers and to my community. And so uh, it's kind of uh, interesting that I'm at this point where I'm still kind of doing the kind of the same thing. So um, so that's about me. And so and you can read a little bit more about my positionality in this Limage project um, on my website over here. But like I said, I lot I learned a lot through this, right? And so things that, you know, I, I there are things I had ignorance about uh, throughout the project as well. So 
Yeah. So this project, the Limage project, is the Language Identity Multiculturalism and Global Empowerment Project. And so L-I-M-A-G-E, Limage for short, which I'm super proud of this acronym. <laughs> and so uh, and so you can check out the project website here. On, and I also share um, like the project output on my Instagram, my public professional Instagram as well. And so you can follow me on Instagram. I was funded by the International Student Experience Fund at U of T. And it was also in col collaboration collaboration with the International Education Center at UTM. Yeah. So within my positionality, right? And so uh, what I wanted to do here was, okay, so um, because of my upbringing as a like a multicultural, multilingual person, um, um, there were many students that I relate to, right, at U of T. And so um, oftentimes students talk to me about growing up multilingual in Toronto, in the greater Toronto area, for example. And so I relate to a lot of their issues that they have, right, growing up multilingual. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, like there were things that I don't know specifically about the specific experiences that these students have. And so I want to listen to their story. So this is where this project kind of came from. But also in my positionality, right, as sort of someone with a bit of privilege in this position of like being a professor at the University of Toronto, I thought really hard about what I can do for these students, right, realistically speaking, this is also where this project came from. And so what I wanted to do was I thought that, you know, to sort of help these some of these linguistically marginalized students, what I wanted to do was listen to their stories first, I think, like, to be their ally, I wanted to start by listening to their stories first, like truly speaking. Uh, and then I wanted to use my privilege and my sort of authority here uh, to sort of uh, amplify their voices by transmitting their stories in the form of comics, right, in a really public way, so that people can relate to their stories and hear them, right? And so um, a lot of these students really had the desire to be seen and heard in their community. And so I thought that I might be able to help them out through the medium of comics here. Yeah. Um, and as I mentioned already, my motivation to do this project came from like stories I've heard from students in my classroom, for example, already. And so a lot of times students would come to office hours uh, in my classes and tell me things like, I don't know, for example, a Chinese international student might say something like, oh, I'm so sorry, like my English is not very good. Or, you know, a heritage language speaker of Urdu might say something like, well, I, I speak Urdu kind of, but like I'm, I'm like, I'm really embarrassed about how bad it is and things like that. And so like students apologize about the languages that they know or don't know, right? Uh, and this really broke my heart as a linguist because like language is really strongly tied to your identity. So you shouldn't have to apologize <laughs> for who you are, right? Um, and so, um, so this is why I really wanted to kind of do this sort of thing to sort of make sure that these like marginalized students are heard and feel valid in their community, yeah. Um, so um, in like, I interviewed like 13 students uh, in this project. What I did was I interviewed 13 real multilingual students at U of T and turned their stories into comics. Um, and so, and similar themes emerged, uh, like when I was talking to some of these students. And so, for example, Amina is an Arabic speaker. And so she was talking about the kind of discrimination that she faces as an Arabic speaker. Sometimes people have the stereotype that Arabic is angry or aggressive and things like that. She told me about that, which is really heartbreaking, right? Um, or, um, for example, uh, this is Maham, uh, who speaks Punjabi uh, and Urdu. Um, and she said that, well, you know, uh, her grandmother uh, speaks Punjabi. And so this is where, like, who she speaks Punjabi with. Um, but her grandmother um, doesn't speak Urdu. And Urdu is the, the prestige language in Pakistan, for example, right? And Punjabi is kind of like the marginalized, stigmatized language sometimes. Um, and so, and, uh, and her grandmother, who doesn't speak Punjabi, be, uh, would express shame about not being able to speak Urdu and things like that. And so thematically speaking, all of these stories were about, you know, the marginalization of some of the languages that they know. And so um, it, it is really kind of heartbreaking, right? Uh, so I, I, I was hoping to sort of uh, transmit their stories, you know, like tell the real stories about these experiences that students have, but also have sort of an uplifting component, right, about what we can do about these kinds of situations. So this is what this project was about. <laughs> um, so before um, this um, talk, um, um, 
uh, I got some questions ahead of time. And one of the questions was, um, were indigenous students involved in this project? <laughs> uh, and the answer is yes, we had Alicia who is Anishinaabe and Mofa Mohawk. Uh, and so we had at least one student involved in this. And so I wanted to tell you a story about her just to give you a picture of what these comics looked like and what the project output was like. Yeah. Um, and so Alicia uh, is a fourth year student at U of T and she's Ojibwe and Mohawk. And so she speaks English and Anishinaabe Moen um, and she's working on Mohawk. Um, I think she was saying, yeah, here. Um, and she said that her dad passed away when she was really young. Um, and so she grew up speaking mostly English for this reason. And But when she was 18, she started learning Anishinaabe Moen. Um, and she said that a part of the reason why she's really passionate about learning Anishinaabe Moen was because her dad showed up in her dream one night and reminded her of the importance of her heritage language. Um, and so in the dream, she was encouraged to learn Anishinaabe Moen. Yeah. Um, and so she was self-studying a lot, right? Uh, and uh, But also at U of T, like taking courses. But importantly, she said one of the, the most important things that she did was that she went to an Ojibwe immersion summer camp in order to learn the language. Um, and she said that the camp was technically not for younger people. <laughs> she said she was, technically it was for parents who wanted to like teach their children Anishinaabe Moen, but she was like, I don't care, I'm gonna go anyway. And she said it was totally worth it, yeah. Um, so she said that it was really intense, you know, that the, the camp was largely in Anishinaabe Moen, and so like it was really difficult at first, but it was so worth it at the end. She said, don't give up, right? I asked her like, what message do you want to like, like tell people like about this whole kind of process? She was just like, don't give up, you know, it's hard at first learning a new language, but it's so worth it in the end is what she said. And so she said that, you know, this, this language was an important anchor for kind of connecting to her Anishinaabe identity. Um, and so um, she, she's really happy that she did it. Uh, and after the camp, right, one of the difficulties with Anishinaabe Moen, uh, which probably only has about 28,000 speakers worldwide, is to like find people to talk to, right, to kind of like maintain that language in the long run. And so she says that right now she like tries to call her Ojibwe mentor as often as she can. And she also talks to like friends from immersion camp, but this is where there's a lot of difficulty, right? Um, and it kind of like, you know, um, <laughs> made me feel a certain way when she told me that like she, she also practices by talking to herself a lot at night. Um, and so, and this is the kind of like, you know, as English speakers and as French speakers, right? Like we have the privilege of just being able to talk to anyone in our language, but this is just something that we don't stop to think about what kind of a privilege that is, right? Yeah. So one of the things that she appreciates at U of T, she said, is that um, the Center for Indigenous Studies at U of T creates various opportunities for students like her to use her heritage language. And so, for example, um, even like in a class where it's not an indigenous studies class, um, for example, a worldviews class, um, she was encouraged to like do a presentation in Anishinaabe Moen, allowing her to have this context in which she can use her heritage language in an academic context, right? Which is um, really great for her identities. Um, um, and so she also like runs uh, the study groups at U of T to practice Anishinaabe Moen. So she's like full of fire. It was such a pleasure talking to her and just like the resilience that she has and just like what she does in her in her place as a student to kind of really uh, maintain the heritage language, not just for her, but for her entire community. So this is one of my favorite stories from the series for sure. Um, and so she is, uh, she called this her language learning journey is what she called it. And so uh, she said that this is super vital for her heritage and her people. So this is a story of Alicia. And so this is what the comics looked like. Uh, I, like I said, I, I make the comics myself um, in this kind of style. Uh, and what was important was in this kind of series, um, I, I had the comics that told the real stories of the students, but then it was also followed up with a linguistics lesson, a really brief uh, lay audience aimed linguistics lesson about the languages that were featured in the student stories. And so, for example, after Alicia's story, I also had a post about Anishinaabe Moen linguistics, um, who I consulted with Dr. Marianne Corbier, who is an Anishinaabe uh, linguist uh, in the area. So, uh, for example, we talked about, um, you know, in English, we have like, you know, first person, second person, third person, right, uh, in the grammar. But um, in, in Anishinaabe Moen, there's actually what's called the fourth person as well. Uh, and so this little um, 
piece right here is about that, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, and as a the question in chat about sharing these, please share share the comics and the stories widely, please. That's what these are here for. So thank you for asking. Yeah. Um, so there were 13 students who were involved in this project in a whole variety of languages. And so the linguistics lesson most prototypically were about like the grammar, the phonology, et cetera, of the language. So this is about Somali noun classes, different suffixes that nouns have and things like that. This is about Turkish phonology. Turkish has what's called a, um, a vowel harmony rule. And so you can read about that on the website if you want. But like we did like real linguistics, yeah, uh, in this project. Sometimes less prototypically, some of the um, the infographics uh, were about like language variety. Um, and so in South Africa, for example, because there was one, uh, an Afrikaans speaker uh, as a part of the project as well. And so here we're featuring like South African sign language, etc. Um, the Punjabi one was more about the history of the language and how it came out to be, right, especially in terms of like the prestige sort of like social social situation that I talked about earlier between Punjabi and Urdu, like why does that dynamic exist? And so a historical contextualization was sometimes the lesson. Um, and sometimes it was sort of a contrastive linguistics lesson. Um, and so one um, uh, student spoke both Spanish and Portuguese, uh, which is often thought to be like a very similar language, but like there's actually a lot of differences. And so like sometimes um, the lesson was a highlight of that, yeah. Um, so this was the full range of um, um, languages that were featured in this cycle of the Limage project. Um, I couldn't have done this all by myself. Um, and so I led the info creation of the infographics, but each infographic had an expert consultant um, who I paid as well to review the content of and things like that. And so I'm grateful for the community that I had for working on this kind of thing. But amazing, right? This kind of, uh, of diversity that we have. <laughs> Um, so also before the talk, someone asked about like, oh, what do we learn about like dialects and sociolects and like mixed languages in the community that we have in Toronto, for example, right? It's a really good question. Um, so I was actually hoping for more dialectal variation in the languages that we saw. Um, like, for example, like I was kind of expecting that there would be at least one like Jamaican Patois speaker, right? That would want their um, voices heard and things like that. But we didn't get any for some reason. Well, actually, I think I know why. So this was the flyer that I used for like um, recruiting participants in the project. Um, and I think like um, I have some regrets about how I phrased things in the poster because I said, are you multilingual? Do you speak a language, et cetera? And I think like for like lay people, sometimes they don't think of certain dialects as being a language, a separate language that they know, right? Or because of the stigmatization that feel from society, they feel like, you know, their language, the dialect that they speak is not valid enough for this kind of thing. And so I wish I contextualize it a little bit more so that that more students would have felt more compelled uh, to participate. And so maybe for the second cycle, right, this is something that I want to do. Yeah. Um, so some part like uh, testimony from the participants, um, like all in all, they gave it a five out of five for the experience and they really loved having their voices be heard. Um, so one of the students said, thank you for like, you know, making our voices be heard in the community. Um, and so they, they really, and I really worked with the students to make sure that the story was told in an authentic and a truthful way for them. And so they appreciated that part of the project too. And so generally, I think they want more projects like this in the future. So the purpose of this project was to increase the U of T community's intercultural competence. And so obviously by listening to these students' student stories, you might learn a thing or two about, you know, a community that you're not a part of, right? And have more empathy for communities that you're not a part of. And also secondarily to raise awareness about linguistics as a field, because it's sort of an obscure field that people don't know about. So, so I consider myself a sort of a public linguist. Um, and so I, I do a lot of public facing work in linguistics like this. Like I said, I share shared all the comics on social media and things like that. And so it, and I also had like a, a public uh, exhibit of the comics at the UTM campus as well, which was well received. Um, and so for me, my task is to make sure that I teach linguistics in a way that is linked to people's lived experiences. Like I say, one of my objective is to like, you know, get people to be 
to care about linguistics and linguistic diversity. How do you do that? Well, you know, if people feel like linguistics is for them, right? Linguistics is everywhere and relevant to their lives, then they're going to be curious about it, right? And so if there's a story that they can relate to in the project, or if they find something, right, that, that is also relevant to their lives somehow, and they're going to feel like linguistics is something that they can do and learn. And so this is why I do this kind of project. Um, and you also might be wondering, I think I also got this question as well. So why like disseminate this kind of research and these kinds of stories in the format of comics in particular, uh, right? And so that's a good question. And so long story short, um, comics have a unique advantage as a medium of art. So so comics have the power of universality. This is what art theorists, theorists have said. And so, so for a moment, take a look at the leftmost picture right here on this slide. Um, this is sort of like a pretty realistic like illustration of myself, right? So you look at this and you go, oh yeah, this is like definitely I, right? This like principal investigator right here, right? But the more abstract the art becomes, the more relatable it becomes, right? So looking at the middle picture, it's like, okay, so you look at this one and you go, okay, so this could still be me, like I, the principal investigator, but like this could be thousands of other people now too. You know what I mean, right? Uh, but then like on the right hand side, right, the farthest right picture, the more abstract version, this could literally be millions of people, right? Um, and so uh, because of the simplified nature of it. And so this is why like when you're reading comics, right, you literally look at the character and you go, oh, this could be me. So it allows for an easy entry into this kind of empathy, I feel like. Yeah. Um, so there is another um, kind of uh, uh, advantage that comics have that I learned uh, throughout this project. Yeah. Um, and so someone was talking about like how how uh, trauma and like how uh, is involved right in stories like this when like students go through um, these kinds of microaggressions like uh, like uh, relevant to their languages like Amina did for example with Arabic right that is a form of trauma that these students go through and so is art like sort of therapeutic in some way or like how does art help with that how do comics help with that and so um so this is something that i actually learned from um shelly wall from um, biomedical communications at u of t um and so uh this is not something that i knew before working on this project but um i learned from her that one of the things that comics is beneficial for is um its ability to use like visual metaphors to talk about difficult concepts and topics, right? And so a lot of these stories are about microaggressions that people face because of their language, which can be traumatizing or re-traumatizing, right? Like when they are reading the story, okay? And so to reduce the re-traumatization as much as possible for the reader, what you can do as a comics artist is to sort of like not depict those difficult situations in sort of a literal way, but sort of like, you know, use metaphors visually to communicate it instead, which makes it a little bit like lighter and like easier to process, right, for the reader. So for example, um, this student is Mustafa, uh, who speaks um, uh, English uh, and Urdu, uh, but also he's uh, he identifies as a neurodivergent student. And so the, his story was primarily about that. And so he was saying that, well, because of my neurodivergence and the sort of the linguistic sort of practices that come along with it, uh, he gets criticized a lot, right? And he gets like misunderstood a lot, right? When he's communicating in English. And so, you know, uh, people tell him he overshares, he rambles too much, he doesn't do small talk correctly, right? And so he feels like he has to mask all the time, right? Not feeling like himself, which is quite traumatizing, obviously. Um, and so here, this is a scene from his comic where I depicted that kind of um, like um, hard relationship with his language in sort of a more metaphorical way uh, where, you know, he, there's the piece of clay being molded into a certain shape, but, you know, um, talking about how we can, you know, form it back into uh, the shape of himself at the end. And so, um, so this is something that is really kind of useful with comics as well. Yeah, as opposed to something more realistic, like photos or videos or things like that, right? So, yeah. Um, and I also primarily use the art style of manga, as you might have noticed. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but it's a Japanese comics, essentially. And so I grew up reading lots of manga. And so, as you know, from my introduction, I grew up as a Japanese American person. And so this is what I'm familiar with, right? 
Um, and so oftentimes uh, manga is associated with these like really expressive uh, like facial features, right? And also like a lot of effects in the background that sort of allow for a lot of like empathy from the reader. Like you can really feel what the characters are feeling in this kind of style. So this is a scene from a Ukrainian story, a Ukrainian student story, Sophia. Um, and so you see those little bubbles, <laughs> bubbles in the background. And so like, this is very manga. This is very much like, you know, sentimental, feeling evoking kind of effect that's really distinct in manga and things like that. And so because empathy was a powerful tool for what I wanted to communicate, um, this style in particular, I thought was really kind of good for this as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I interviewed 13 students, right, and had 13 distinct stories, but there was an emerging theme that came out of all of these stories. And one of them was this like language as home, right, as the title of my talk today indicates, what does that mean, right? So for example, this is Sophia. Um, and so Sophia is a Ukrainian speaker. And obviously for her, her physical home is like under attack, right, because of the Ukrainian-Russian war. And so uh, whenever her physical home is not accessible by physical means by th like that, right, she told me that she feels a lot of pride in the Ukrainian language itself as being her home, right? Right? that's something that like no intruder can actually take away from her you know what i mean and so like ukrainian itself is home for her um and another student here mariam who speaks turkish turkman in english she said that well as an immigrant to canada like english is not my dominant language so like english i use primarily for school so english feels very academic to her she said right which i also i kind of understand but she said that you know no matter where i am though um like a like, turkish uh is my home right and so she also i think has like difficult relationships with her home country itself um because of like political reasons and things like that but language is not something that they can take away from her like language will always be home to her right um, for Alicia, the Anishinaabe Moment speaker, right, quite literally, um, colonizers took her home. Um, and so language is not something that they can take away, right? And so uh, the Anishinaabe Moment language is an important anchor for her to connect to, to her indigenous identity as well. Um, this is Mariela, who speaks um, Argentinian uh, Spanish and Brazilian Portuguese. And so something that she told me was, um, again, this is kind of told metaphorically in this scene right here, but she said that, you know, Brazilian people often tell her she's not Brazilian enough. She's too Argentinian, right? And Argentinian people tell her she's too Brazilian uh, and like that she's not Argentinian enough, et cetera, right? And so like, she's always kind of made to feel like an outsider uh, because of her mixed heritage. Um, she said that in that kind of of case, right? Um, the fact that her multilingualism, um, she called it span portlish because she speaks Spanish, Portuguese, and English all at the same time. She said that span portlish is my home because, like, you know, that's who I am, right? Like, like, all, like all of me exists at once when I speak that kind of language, right? And so that is home for her too. And she's also moved around a lot around the globe, so this is important as her anchor to her identity, language as home. This is Iben, who is a uh, Afrikaans speaker, and so as you may know, Afrikaans is uh, it's, it's a language that has a lot of historical baggage in South Africa. It's the language of the oppressor uh, during the apartheid era, right? And of course, even as a young student was born after the apartheid era, but uh, she also acknowledges the fact that the Afrikaans language is connected to that kind of historical baggage. And so her story is about how, as a young person, you deal with that kind of identity, right? Um, and so uh, like Afrikaans, uh, like she, wh however she feels about the history itself, right? Language is something that she does have. Um, and so how do you sort of reconfigure her language um, as her home, right? Is something that she thinks about because she's an international student in Canada as well. And so a language here in Canada, right? Uh, her ability to feel her Afrikaans identity is strongly tied to the Afrikaans um, language that she speaks. And so this is something that she's kind of juggling as well. So also quite a sentimental story here, yeah. Um, 
this is Tim, international student. No, no, she's a, you know, he is a domestic. He's a local student here. Um, so he's a Chinese Canadian student. And so he didn't always speak Mandarin and Cantonese growing up, which is, uh, which are his heritage languages. He only started to recently reconnect with his heritage languages for various reasons. But um, for him, right, like, because he grew up in Canada, he is Canadian. So like, China is not his physical home by any means, in sort of in a similar way that like, Japan is not really my home either as a Japanese American person, but the Chinese language, right? And so like Cantonese or Mandarin is what allows for him to like connect with his relatives and family and to his Chinese heritage. And so in that sense, his languages are also his home as well, right? Yeah. So um, this was a theme that came up. Um, and another theme that kind of came up was, okay, so this is your anchor to your identity, your heritage languages in Canada is an anchor of your identity. So how do you maintain your heritage language uh, abroad is another theme that came up. So um, of course, like in order for you to maintain your heritage, you need access to resources, you need books, you need lessons about your languages, um, you need sometimes to travel to the language school, right? Um, so you need like cards and things like that, and you need access to the community that is willing to teach those kinds of lessons and things like that. And so access is really important. Community is important, like with Alicia's case with Anishina Bemowen. Um, like whether you have access to people who speak those languages is like like a fundamental issue for indigenous language users, right? And so, like, how do we how do we help with that? Right, is something that I really kind of felt after this project as well. Um, sometimes what you need is money as well. Um, and so in order for you to maintain your heritage language, this is sort of a class issue. Um, this is me in like 1994, before I was moving to the United States. And so, like I said, I am fully bilingual in Japanese and English, um, but a big part of the reason why I am fluent in Japanese still is because my parents could afford to send me to Japanese Saturday school growing up, number one, and number two, because they were able to, um, they were able to afford flights back to Japan every summer so that I could go to like Japanese school in the summer or like, you know, play with my relatives uh, in Japan as well, right? And this is not discussed enough. Like sometimes people think, oh, like, why don't you speak your heritage language? And like all these young students are criticized as being lazy for not maintaining their heritage language sometimes, but like sometimes it's things beyond their control, right? And so it's not fair to them. That's something I definitely learned th through this as well. And even if you have money and access and resources, right, there's other social factors as well. So this is um, uh, uh, Hafsa, who is a, a Somali speaker. And she said that basically like growing up in high school where she felt kind of minoritized in some ways, like, you know, uh, like uh, she, she like, it's, like her appearance didn't match like people's like idea of being African, uh, like because of the color of her skin and things like that. And so, you know, that that gave her complicated feelings about like her Somali identity, for example, right, which influences your desire to connect to, to your heritage language in this kind of case, right. Growing up for me as well, I grew up in a very white neighborhood of the suburbs of Atlanta. And so I was made to feel like speaking Japanese was not cool, right. And so for a really long time, I felt like I had to sort of distance myself from that for protection, for social protection, right? And so these guys and the things are not talked about enough. And so I hope that I, I talked about it more, right, through a project like this so that people are aware of it. Yeah. So next steps after this project. And so uh, this phase of the uh, project has concluded for now, and it was really a blast, honestly. I'm really so grateful for the students who participated. So these themes kind of came up, language is home, I said, and I asked the students after the project in an exit survey, like what they think we should do about the themes that emerged as a result of this project. So like we learned that language is a home, and so like how can we kind of like, what, what should we do about this in the university community, right? Some students said, oh, like maybe like we need more of these like promotions of language and country specific student associations. Something that I learned from these students through the interviews is that they felt like sometimes these associations exist, right, specific to languages and countries and heritages, but they don't know how to find these associations is what they said in their first year. And so it's like only in their third or fourth year that they discover it, for example, through word of mouth or something like that. And so by then it's kind of too late, right, and things like that. And so how do we allow 
for access, right, for students uh, like that. Um, some students said maybe we just need more like trained support for students, right, in terms of empowerment and things like that. Um, another theme that came up was the suppression of microlinguistic identities. And so a lot of times the university kind of like lumps Arabic speakers together as Arabic speakers, like even though there are like so many different varieties of Arabic, like Chinese speakers, even though there's many different uh, varieties of Chinese, for example. And so they felt like they they were not seen as individuals sometimes. And so I asked the students, what should we do about that? Right. And so again, like um, like uh, like promoting like language and country specific student associations would be helpful. Um, and also like maybe some events that promote linguistic diversity like this project, right? Um, another thing that came up is um, uh, students felt like there's not a lot of context in which you could be your full linguistic self, right? I said that speaking Japan English is my full linguistic self, but there's not a lot of places where I can be that. You know what I mean? Like with like Mariela as well, speaking spam portlish is not something you can always do. So what can we do about that? And so uh, again, like maybe more events that promote that kind of thing or from my professor end, right? Maybe assessments where students are allowed to be their full linguistic self is what we need as well yeah and so after this i will be working on um, an academic publication about the output of the limage project um, with the student participants involved i strongly feel that um, me getting sort of a academic prestige out of this project is unethical like me alone i feel like the students who participated who are the experts of their own linguistic experiences should also be involved in the academic output as well and so i'm going to have them as co-authors on the academic publication as well and i'm also working on uh things about accessibility uh as related to the comic output as well and after that hopefully uh, we'll have a phase two of this in the interest of time, I'm going to skip to the end, but you can learn more about behind the scenes of this project on my project website. I actually kept a journal about how everything went. Uh, and this project was a result of the help of a lot of people. And so please check that out as well. And thank you so much for listening and happy to take questions. And yeah, please follow me on Instagram or Twitter if you have an account. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Taniguchi, for the enlightening discussion. Uh, we'll open the floor to some questions now in our last 10 minutes here. So first, before I go to questions in the chat, does anyone want to speak up and ask any questions live? Feel free to raise your hand. Uh, yes. We have a question from Nina. Um, hello, thanks a lot for the thanks a lot for allowing me to ask a question, and thanks a lot, I, for the lovely, lovely presentation. I worked on a similar topic. Um, actually, my research looked at um, migration and climate change from the island nation of Tuvalu, and I looked at how the immigrants connect back to their roots and how they and how they preserve the attachment to the homeland. And language came as a very strong theme, as a strong enabler of connection to the roots, to the homeland um, that is under danger um, of land decay and land loss due to sea level rise. And always um, the participants refer to language as home, as um, a hub of belonging, and as having an authentic gate through which they can connect with the motherland and the ancestral roots and knowledge. Um, and I mean, however, that made me think quite a lot considering the different contexts um, of immigration and people living, I mean, migrating to different places around the world. How can we exactly define home? I mean, to understand the intersection between language and home, how can we define home? Is it a country? Is it a place? Is it a physical house? Is it a community or a quarter? Is it family and people? how can we exactly consider home as an entity either as an abstract notion or something physical thank you yeah that's an excellent question and that is the question that i think emerged from this project and i'm honestly still kind of thinking about it um and i would love to talk to you about what you have uh um thought about it as well but yeah i think um for me right now 
uh, I'm just kind of processing the fact that home is not a physicality. Um, and I think like that, that, that I think we can say for sure, like home is not a physical location by any means, but I wonder what the common denominator is, right? Like we had many different kinds of answers about what home is. For me personally speaking, it's where you feel like your full self is I feel like what it comes down to, right? Um, so, and, and for me, like it, that, that, that is not any particular location or not even any particular person or anything like that. But language, like the way that I express myself through language, is such a big part of when I can feel like I am the entirety of me. Um, I think in Mariela's story, who speaks um, Portuguese and Spanish, in her last scene, she said something like, you know. Um, like here I am, like all parts of me exist on the same heartbeat is what she says, right? Through the, all the languages that she knows. Um, and so maybe it's something about that, like just feeling like you are your 100% self in many senses of that word. But thank you for raising that important question. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And um, I look forward to having a further discussion about it with you. So thanks again. Yes, please. Yeah, let's talk. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that answer and that great question. Um, so a question in the chat coming from KP asks, for those that were born here and begun life with English and are too embarrassed to speak their other native languages, how do we preserve our language and culture? Feels like a lot of pressure and I really hope to and want to preserve it and not be part of the lineage where it dies off. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that question. And it's a question that many people have in Canada, um, especially in the greater Toronto area, and especially many of our young students, for example, as well. Um, so something that I've at least learned from like Tim's story, who is a heritage Chinese language speaker, is that um, you know, first of all, I think there needs to be more education in the public about how speaking a heritage is sort of a continuum, right? And so people think that being multilingual, like you have to be like fluent to be like considered multilingual or something like that. But no, like there's actually many different ways to be a multilingual. There's many different ways to be a heritage language user. So I am sort of like, you know, like on one end of the spectrum where I speak Japanese and English quite comfortably both of them but I also have cousins who are also like Japanese American who one of them like is a passive bilingual and so like she can understand Japanese um, but doesn't like necessarily speak it um, fluently but that is a valid type of like bilingualism actually and I don't think that's talked about enough right and so I think like 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 the the destigmatization of that kind of situation like of fluency or lack thereof um, needs to be kind of uh, more prevalent in society I think so there's what that's one thing I have to say about that and the second thing that I learned from Tim's story is that so he had an interesting situation he is Chinese by heritage but he's really fluent in Japanese because he self-taught it from a really young age because of an interest in Japanese culture anime and manga and things like that actually um, and then I asked him well like so what made you want to like reconnect with your heritage language and keep up with it right um, because he said that he went through kind of a rebellious phase where he like didn't like feel like like you know studying Chinese and things like that and he said that well it was actually funnily enough like because of my interest in Japanese because Japanese borrows characters like Chinese characters in the writing system and so he started to get interested in like historical Japanese and then started learning about Chinese uh, language and things like that and then he started to connect with his heritage a lot more that way and so I think a really good way to get young people or anyone to get sort of interested in maintaining the heritage language is to appeal to like what other interests they have again I think it's again back to the first question it's about like kind of like acknowledging and honoring the entire identity of a person right not just the language the heritage itself but like what other interests they have and like if you can bring all of that into one context I think um, that's going to be a really uh, fruitful kind of environment for sustaining a language but again that requires a lot of resources too so yeah thank you for asking that yeah. <laughs> thank you for that um, are there other questions people would like to ask live during the call? Uh, yes, Catherine. So thank you for this presentation. I think it's very powerful in sort of allowing us to reflect on our own experiences. 
Um, one thing that I was wondering, would you consider doing maybe this, but on a longitudinal scale? Because I would be interested to see how people sort of change as they mature and they pass different milestones. So I personally am a little bit older than the students in the study. But one thing that I see is when I see my friends start to have children, then the whole culture, language, home, that really becomes something they struggle with because do you teach them your heritage language, your home culture? For them, home might be just, Toronto might be the only place they've ever seen. But if they're a racialized minority, they will always have the burden of sort of being asked, you know, where are you from? Do you speak this other language? So they have to carry this. So I would be kind of curious to see what your thoughts on it are on this yeah. That is an excellent question, an excellent suggestion um, uh, at the end. Um, so um, I definitely relate to this whole, like, where are you from kind of thing. <laughs> you know, I tell them Atlanta, Georgia, and that's not usually what they want to hear. So, um, uh, but it's an excellent point, a longitudinal version of this, right? Um, so one, um, something that you've picked up on, uh, obviously, is the fact that a, a theme that wasn't necessarily highlighted in this phase was how your linguistic identity can fluctuate and change over time, right? Um, and this is not something I necessarily thought about before this project, but you're absolutely right. And I think there needs to be a normalization of that as well, right? Because a lot of the students felt like, well, like, I never studied my heritage language as a young person. So why start now? It's too late, right? And they feel kind of an embarrassment about going back to it and things like that. And so um, I think like in a future um, iteration of this kind of project, I, I want to have something that highlights the fact that it's okay that you have a different relationship with your heritage language at different points in your life. Like I said, I definitely felt uncool about like speaking Japanese in high school. And so I kind of stepped away, you know, from, from that for, for a little while. And I started to really connect with my Japanese heritage when I was an undergrad, actually, when I like met other like Japanese international students, for example, right? Um, and so I think that's an excellent point, just kind of like highlighting like it, it's okay for your identity to change over time. I think we people tend to think of like identity, especially in sort of a linguistic or cultural sense as something that's static, but many studies show that it's, it's really not static, right? It's, it's something that changes over time. And so um, combined with some of the other questions that were asked, right? I think this is an important message for young people because they need to be aware of the fact that things can change um, and it's okay to be in whatever point uh, you, uh, in life you are at with your language, right? So yeah, thank you for asking that. And I'm sure I'm hope to I hope to highlight that in a future cycle. Yeah. <laughs> thank you again for that answer. And thank you once again for a, a wonderful presentation. It's so nice to see research presented in a unique and visually interesting way through comics and hear these amazing stories that the students shared thank with you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we've reached the end of our presentation time today. Um, so thank you everyone who's able to attend. Uh, like Austin said in the chat, if your questions weren't answered, they'll be passed on to Dr. Tanaguchi uh, for further reflection later. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the next Knowledge Cafe. Thank Thanks, you so everyone. much. Thank you so much for attending. Feel free to um, yeah follow me on social media or send me emails as well with questions. Thank you. <laughs> Um, slides can be shared if you missed it. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>